McGinn, <laughs> McGregor, McTominay in midfield. That is a midfield in my taste. Fantastic. There's so much power in there. When we saw McGinn, when he arrived in Germany, dancing with a folk amazing, dancer. Isn't it? <laughs> ah, I love it. He used his bum, big bum, uh, dancing around. So I love the uh, job. Hi, this is your host, Marcus Fjortoft, along with co-host Jan Fjortoft. And we are delighted to welcome you to what is now called the Fußball Channel. Having done the German Fußball podcast the last two years, we will continue with our coverage, both going into Euros, seeing the reactions to the stuff that we've posted beyond the Bundesliga as well. We are very excited to welcome you to the Fußball Channel. Dad, if you'd care to compliment on our our, on our recent announcement as such, it's been a great two years calling it the German Football Podcast. And then we won't shift totally away from the Bundesliga course, but we'll just add to the assortment, I guess. Yeah, I guess it's a, it's a, it's a better description of what we do uh, in our interest is. Uh, it's, it's no secret that our two big loves are, uh, are, are, are is a Premier League and the Bundesliga. So we keep the Fußball the football channel so it's it's more that we get a name now that more describe the platforms we are on we will of course do after every bundesliga round our summary and we'll that's why we keep the football uh, in there instead of the football channel uh, and we we'll, we we'll keep it there and it's a good way to start now uh, with the euros coming up now we are just days away from a big big tournament in maybe the country that most should have these kind of events because they have a proven record. We do remember the, the World Cup uh, back in 2006, Sommermärchen, the, the, the summer adventure, so to say, uh, at that time. And it was a good way to start. And I've, I've done my preparation. I'm going to sit with the Austrian channel uh, Servus TV, TV with, together with Stefan Freund. Uh, and I was in, we are recording this Tuesday evening and uh, yesterday, Monday, I was down there and made a pre-show. Uh, so uh, if you think I'm, I look a bit tired, it's because I yet yet haven't got my uh, I haven't got my private jet yet, uh, Marcus. So so I have to take a normal route. So yeah, that's the so, missing but part. Doing, but we do look forward to it, Marcus. There's a lot of preparations going into uh, to the Euros because there are so many teams, so many coaches, so many ways of playing, and and players injured and and all those kind of. Thing. Look at, at Holland with, with De Jong to use, or also with Alaba. So a lot of big players missing out. Yeah, and you certainly do have to be prepared then because you have a pretty hectic, albeit a fun uh, month ahead, but still rather hectic. You mentioned that you're going to be with, with Seves de Fao. Um, a pretty non-stop schedule for you with games after games, day after day. Could you enlighten us with, with what that would look like with you for the Euros? Yes, we, we do uh, 22 days, 22 days of, uh, of, the, of the Euros. That meaning that we're more or less the one to three games a day, but we, uh, we won't do every, all, all the games. We do the big ones. We do all nine games. Uh, 21 is uh, the 15, 18, 21 Central uh, European time. Uh, and I'm doing... Uh, all games, most minus five with, with Stefan Freund, but Stefan will also be in, in Germany for a while, but we stay in Salzburg. And I'm so ambitious what I'm going to do because I'm, you know, Marcus, I'm very disciplined. So, but, but still, I look forward to being in the same hotel room for a month because it, it's not the worst summer job you can do, actually. But on the other hand, I then I said to said to Stefan when I was together with him on Monday, I said, Yeah, and then we can do a bit of mountain climbing. And yes, then we can go and visit that sea. And he said, and he said, Jan, are you thinking of gonna do so many games and you planning all that kind of activity? So so it's gonna be uh, up in the morning, do a bit training, do a bit other stuff, and then just prepare for 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 the games. I mean, uh, and and what a start, Marcus. We have, if if I may say. On Friday, I mean, it, I could, I could, it, in my opinion, that couldn't be made up better because you have the host, Germany, of course, great football nation, won the World Cup so many times, the Euros winning so many times, uh, a bit struggling, but then they've got an atmosphere again now and so on. And then they play against the mighty, passionate uh, Scotland. And I, and I read an article in the German paper and, and I, I thought, 
they glorize Shaitan. Is is that when they miss out, they do it spectacular. And I think that that's why the expectation we have for Scotland coming to this uh, to, to this World Cup, it's yes. It, they they qualified in the Norwegian group. If they were not there, we would be there, Norway. But then again, uh, a championship with Scotland is fantastic. When the Tartan army will arrive in Scotland, uh, sorry, uh, the Scot Scots will arrive in Germany, and they will kind of there will be Tartan kind of color, kind of German atmosphere from day one. There's no better combo, I think, than the Tartan army going to Germany with the with the beer is flowing. The Scots are in back-to-back -back European championships. Mind you, the last European championship, a bit marred in the fact that it was coming off COVID, so you didn't still have that same. But now we have reports of 200,000 Scots uh, coming along. If we start with the host, Dad, we have that coming up on Friday. And we have quite the, the assortment of, of guests on this show. When we spoke to Christian Falk, who was at the Germany training at the time, to hear what he thought of Germany going into the tournament. Hello, Marcus. Hello, Jan. I'm at the training of the German national team at the moment. They are behind me and uh, their training is hard to be successful at the European Championship. Uh, in my view, normally uh, Germany has to dominate this group, of course. They have the home advantage and they should be the better team. But when you saw the test against Greek and Ukraine, you have to be a little bit afraid because at the beginning against the Scots, it's not so easy to score um, if you make a draw and then play against Hungary, uh, who are really good in making a very fast forward attacks. Uh, you can also lose. So in my view, if we have to go in the last match against Switzerland and we have to win, Germany could have problems but I don't think so because I'm optimistic I think um, we will score early against the Scots and this goals uh, will make a successful flow for the German team at the European Championship and at the end the quarterfinal perhaps or the half final could be really a target which is possible best regards from Herzog Aurach Christian and that was our podcast friend, uh, Dad Christian Falk, reporting from Germany. Yeah, very, very proud. That's very proud episode, Marcus, because we have uh, some guest voices. This was first Christian Falk, who is actually the Bayern insider, but it's also the, the German national team insider. You can't get closer to the national team than he is. So I'm very proud that we managed on a short notice. Uh, you did well we, today. You did well yeah, today. Yeah, yeah, we had say. a good, good day. <laughs> and uh, you have some good friends of the podcast uh, doing that. So, uh, yeah, uh, great to listen to Christian Falker about Germany because Germany is one of the interesting teams. Uh, Germany will, for some, be favourites. I think that is based on their history. It is based on they've been a host nation. But it's not many games ago when everybody thought that Germany would be scandalous by this World Cup. But no, sorry about the Euros. But it's changed, and especially that 2 0 win uh, in France. And, of course, that Tony Cross. Mighty Tony Cross is back. I was with his brother last night, uh, Monday, uh, in the hangar where we did a pre-show for Sebus TV. And he talked about uh, the cooperation they're having. They have a podcast together. There are two brothers, fantastic relationships between, between them. And, and we spoke about... Tony Cross being the, the, the role model is, is finding the right way to stop at the right time, winning the Champions League, and now he's, he's got games left and as many as possible. And we also asked uh, Christian Falk if he can say something about the, um, the Messiah, more or less, for, for Germany coming back in the folder of Julian Nagelsmann. The comeback of Tony Gross, of course, can be the key factor for the German national team. Um, he gives the team more structure. Um, when you talk players like, I talked with Kai Hobbs, for example, he said, if you have Tony Gross in your back, you feel different, you feel safe. And the other thing is, of course, Manuel Neuer. Uh, everybody is looking at him after the last matches. He wasn't so sure like he was in the past. Um, but I think when the tournament starts, he can be the Manuel Neuer we know from the other tournaments he's one of the greatest goalkeepers in history and we hope that he make his last big tournament for germany yes and tony cross that will be an absolute key player for for germany as will 
a few of the other players further along the field. Now, there's a bit, no, I wouldn't say question marks, but I think there's more optimism related to the, the last third in Germany's uh, attack. You've obviously got two of the most exciting young players in the world, in, in, in Musiala and Wirtz. You have Havertz more than likely starting up top. Fulkrug struggling a bit with an injury. I probably think he would have leaned towards Havertz anyway. And then you've got a, a back four there, most likely uh, of, of Jonathan Ta and, and, and Rudiger. Um, and in the center back positions, and you have Manuel Neuer, who, Fal who Falk mentioned as well, who there is a bit doubt related to, at least amongst the public. I believe a recent oh, yeah. study said that it was 82% were in favor of Tischtegen and, and what have you. But yeah, who do you identify as kind of the key players for Germany and, and just assessment of the overall squad? I will, I will do. I will start with Manuel Neuer because Manuel Neuer, remember, uh, against Hoffenheim, they lost 4 2 against Hoffenheim. He didn't look good. Uh, or, or he made mistakes. I mean, this is one of the best goalkeepers. He's been the most influential goalkeeper for 20 years. He's doing mistakes. He did that in the Champions League semi-final as well, remember? And then it, it was Greece the last game now, wasn't it, when he, when he did uh, in yeah, a yeah. national game? And, and he did a mistake again. So the thing is when people... And, and in between, he's doing fantastic saves and all that. But, you know, Manuel Neuer has been a guy that we trust. We can trust him whatever happens. We can trust him. And Germany got a history of uh, trouble with the goalkeepers at, at, the, at the championship. Uh, uh, back in 86, Uli Stein was sent home. Franz Beckenbauer was sent him home. He couldn't accept being, being not playing. Before the 2006 World Cup, there was a big fight between Julian Nagels, sorry, between Jens Lehmann and Oliver Kahn. Oliver Kahn being the first goalkeeper for Germany for many, many years. And then uh, Jürgen Klinsmann decided to go for Lehmann. And that was a big, big thing back in the day. So now I, I was on the way back today. I was reading all the papers, all the magazines. It's all about Manuel Neuer. And, but it's also uh, a key thing in midfield uh, with, with Gundogan and Toni Kroos. They should play together. Gundogan didn't have his best game now against Greece. So we'll see how that, how can they fit in and Florian Witz and Musial at the same time. Remember, they're young kids. Harvest play up front. That seems to be the the starting line. Where will I put Leroy Sané and so on? Uh, and then, but what I like about Germany is that Rudiger and Fulkrug had a battle in training. So this is what's happening. They they have an open session, been for the crowd to see. I think there was four or five thousand, if I'm I'm not wrong. And they went into each other, bang bang. And I love that. I mean, that means that you're there. That I don't like this. And I have to say, yes, I see Norwegian players always say, yeah, we're so good. We love to be together. Don't love to be together, win football games. And I'm old-fashioned there. It's, it's, of course, good that you like to be together. But I think that those teams need to be, be doing that. I think that Germany uh, need to get a good win uh, to start, to get the flow, to get a, get a nation behind them. Because Germany is an unbelievable traditional football uh, kind of, of nation. So if they win against Scotland, uh, they will kind of, nobody will ask how good Scotland are. They've been maybe not the best form lately and so on. They will just go ballistic if they win the first game uh, against Scotland. And uh, another guest, Marcus, and if, if we're talking about Scotland, we had we had just had to call one, hadn't we, Marcus? <laughs> exactly. We spoke to Derek Ray, who is in Köln, reporting live from Germany, who will be covering the Euros, and what he had to say about the Scotland team. Hello, Jan. Hello, Marcus. This is Derek Ray getting ready for the Euros. And of course, I'm in Köln, the most beautiful city in Germany, as the locals are prone to say, and where better to start the Euros adventure. Now, on Scotland, who will be taking part in the opening match of the tournament against Germany on Friday, what should we expect? Well, support the like of which we won't see for any other country. Scotland are making up for lost time when you consider that between 1998 and 2021, they didn't qualify for a single major tournament. And even in 2021, it was a diminished euro from the point of view of going to the games, pandemic conditions. But now it's back to the way it used to be. And no better country than Germany for Scots to come to in very large numbers 
And it started off at around, we thought, 75,000, maybe 100,000. Now there's talk of 200,000 Scots being here in Germany over the course of the next couple of weeks. It's truly remarkable. Now, on the pitch, Scotland are going to be challenged. But remember, they did qualify in some style, beating Spain, and deservedly so. Norway as well. Sorry to have to mention that. And they were a bit lucky against Norway. Uh, as we all remember near the end of that game. But if you think about how good defensively they were and tactically under Steve Clark, this 5-4-1 formation, then there's every reason to believe Scotland can replicate some of those performances. Now, the recent performances have not been as good, but the midfield for me is strong with the likes of Scott McTominay, seven goals he scored in qualifying, John McGinn, Billy Gilmore, very talented young player, Callum McGregor, But weaknesses elsewhere, I think in the goalkeeper position, I think at right wing back, I think in attack. But of course, Scotland have Kieran Tierney and Andrew Robertson. So it's about the balance being right. And let's see, can Scotland take something from the opening match against Germany? It will be difficult. The bigger games arguably are against Switzerland and Hungary, maybe the more winnable games. But either way, Scots are here in Germany to enjoy themselves And that they will do. And that was another podcast friend of ours that it was Derek Ray. Scotland, which obviously holds a special place for the both of us, having lived there for three years, having played there, having played against some of the players even in this squad. I think it's fantastic to see them. If it wasn't Norway, well, they literally came at the cost of Norway. But if it had to be someone else, Scotland, great people, of course, but a team that is old-fashioned in the sense that Steve Clark's got them defensively solid. They're hard to penetrate. They realize their limitations as such. And because of that, I think they could stand in with a chance. Granted, momentum is with them. If you don't get an early goal against Germany, etc., it will be tough for them. They have some injury concerns as well, but they've got some great types, some great profiles. And like I said to earlier, it's back-to-back European championships for Scotland. You obviously having covered them on both occasions when they played against Norway as well. What would your assessment be of the Scotland team? Well, give me any day of the year. McGinn, (laughs) McGregor, McTominay midfield. That is a midfield in my taste. Fantastic. There's so much power in there. When we saw McGinn, when he arrived in Germany, dancing with a... Amazing, isn't it? (laughs) Ah, I love it. He used his bum, big bum, uh, dancing around. So... I love the, uh, the Scots. I love the way they approach the game. I, 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 I'm a big admirer of Steve Clark, how he's managed to get the best resources out of his team. So I think they could do well. I think they will. I think they will kind of love the first game. Steve Clark will tell the teams, "What do we have to lose in this first game? If Germany win three 0 everybody will say that. Everybody expected that. The host nation, great team. They will do well. But the Scots can surprise them." So uh, I think this is going to be very, very interesting. And as I said at the beginning, one of the best opening games I've ever experienced. It will be fantastic. As Eric said, maybe 200,000 people coming to Munich, Germany, Scotland. What's better at Allianz Arena? Just to finish up Group A, we won't spend as much time on each group, but we do have Hungary and Switzerland in the remaining two positions. Hungary, a strong team. Uh, Schoberschlei, one of the more pronounced players within that. They've qualified, I believe, for three consecutive European championships. And you have Switzerland, who always seem to qualify, at least from the group stages, led by captain, led by our player of the year in the Bundesliga, uh, following our Bundesliga review in Granit Shaka, Shakiri as well. It's a reminder that we have four third place teams that will go through from the group stages and might be one of these teams. Um, going on to group B, Dad. Now, what a group. What we a might group. call this the group of death. We don't know because... No, but I, some... think there are two, I think there are two groups of death. We will talk more about uh, the Netherlands, uh, Poland, uh, Austria and France. That is, yeah. a, But this, gr- this group is unbelievable. Uh, there's some great, great games coming up in, in this group. Yes, we do. And we have two guests reporting on the teams. We obviously have Spain, Italy, Croatia, Albania... And I guess we could start with Spain, Spain, Italy, who have played each other a fair amount of times. You're Italy having um, won on penalties against them in the last Euros. But since then, Spain have won three of the last four. And we have, excuse if I butcher the pronunciation, but we have Guillaume Balaguj, 
uh, our pronounced Spain expert to report on Spain and their chances under De La Fuente. Ah, uh, Spain. See, the thing is, because we won it in 2008 and 2012 and the World Cup in the middle, there is not a huge amount of pressure uh, on on De La Fuente, the manager or the players, to actually win this competition. I think what we demand of Spain is that they entertain us, that they give us something to be excited about uh, in a tournament that is quite open. And if the two or three things that Spain requires to win the tournament um, are put in place, then we could be contenders. What are those? On one hand, we don't have a very fast centre-backs or the most solid defence, really. We concede a lot of chances, especially early in the games. And if we can tie that up, and that is the job of everyone, then obviously uh, it will be of help. If Pedri shows the form that he has shown in the friendlies before the Euros, uh, if the Barcelona midfielder manages to uh, become the uh, the brain of the team in a position close to Morata, the centre forward, uh, a little bit uh, further forward than, than it is with with Barcelona, if he does well, if he does create that magic that's necessary to win to win a tournament, then again we have a chance. And of course, if goals come through Morata and Nico Williams and Lamin Yamal. Uh, who will only be 16, I think he's 17 in July, uh, late in the month. Well, if those things happen, uh, Spain will have the perfect tournament and will have a chance to win it. But realistically, I think Spain will concede a lot of goals, will probably score a lot of goals, we will entertain. I do think we're going to come out of the group stage, but I don't really think we are say, better than France or England. It will be fun to watch us, though. Well, I used to work with Balaguer. I'm not sure how we pronounce that. It's the same when you call Jan Ogefjortov to be abroad. It's quite a, a hard, but a, a great knowledge, of course, of the, of the Spanish team. And it's going to be interesting with, with the Spains. With this, what do we say? Spains? Spaniards? Spaniards? What do we say? The Spanish, the, 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 the the Spanish team. The yeah. Spain's the Spanish team because there's so many young kids there. I mean, with 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 Pedri and uh, the 16 year old Yamal, uh, yes, yeah. He, he yeah. I just read an article before I came on, Marcus, and he said he had some homework that he's bringing to the Euros <laughs> that he has to do. He's 16, mind you, so he will probably have some parents say, "Yeah, whatever you do in football, we know that you play for Barcelona, but listen, you have to end your your school thing." But uh, Spain uh, will be more like an outsider, as will Italy. Uh, Italy will also be they have some they have always they, they got this mentality it's a cliche to say that but they still got this mentality we saw Atalanta with uh, they said they don't have a, a striker but our friend uh, uh, help me again with the pronounce Marcus Scamacca Scamacca, Scamacca. Yes. Scamacca uh, uh, it's a big lad and they say that Italy missed that striker to be a full favourite but if they go to the semi-final or quarter-final, won't surprise anyone. And we spoke to the one and only, the here we go man, who is an Italian himself, Fabrizio Romano. Hi, Jan. Hi, Marcus. Here we go from Italy. Super busy with the transfer market, but also looking forward to the Euros. As always, congratulations for your fantastic work. Happy to be part of this episode and happy to look forward to the Euros. I'm sure it's going to be a tough one for uh, Italy for my beloved national team because we already did a miracle a few years ago at the Euros. I still believe that that was something really, really incredible by Italy and Roberto Mancini. The team was not the best in the competition at all, but they were able, thanks to the team and to their mentality, to build something really special. Now, I feel that it's going to be way more difficult for Italy to compete at the highest level with other national teams. There are several reasons, but basically, one is for sure the injuries. We are missing many important players like Berardi, Zagnolo, Giorgio Scalvini, many crucial players for the Italian national team. Also Francesco Acerbi, Inter centre-back, who has been one of the best defenders around Europe in the last two years. Uh, you still remember his Champions League campaign last season was insane. So we are missing many important players, but also we are missing some international experience. We have 
many good and quality players with a lot of potential, but all of them don't have any kind of European uh, experience. And also they are not used to play at the highest level under pressure. They are more used to play in an Italian league. For example, Alessandro Buongiorno, Torino centre-back, in my opinion, really underrated player, really talented one, but still with no European experience at all. So I'm really curious to see Italy. I think the real crucial player for Italy is going to be Gianluca Scamacca. If Scamacca will perform at the highest level when we see Scamacca performing at his best, as he did against Liverpool, for example, in Champions League, we can really dream to compete for something important. Otherwise, I think we're going to struggle because in all the other positions, we still miss something special. And so we also miss the experience of centre-backs who made history for years uh, here for Italy, like Leonardo Bonucci, Giorgio Chiellini, Acerbi too. So we miss that kind of players, but this new generation, in my opinion, will need some time before performing at the highest level. So. Good luck to Italy. Good luck to you for your usual fantastic episodes for the Euros. I will follow you and big hug. Ciao. Grazie, grazie. And we go, I mean, what do we have? We have Modric. I mean, how old? There's some old players that did, some old stars that did Euros, Marcus. Well, it's for Croatia. It's It's been a concern, not a concern, but we've had a golden generation of Croatia. I mean, Croatia of such a small country. I mean, bronze at the last World Cup, World Cup finalists at, at the previous one. I mean, they have obviously the golden trio. You have Modric, you have Kovacic, you have Brozovic there. You have Kramaric, our favorites from Hoffenheim as yeah, well. Yeah, up, up front give me there. Kramaric. But then you have, you know, calls for a generational shift for a long time, which hasn't really happened. The more younger, more pronounced player that's obviously stolen the headlines is Josko Vardio. Um, who has really stepped up. But since then, we've always thought, well, surely there's they, someone needs to step up. But the, this golden generation keeps holding on. Probably the last one for, for Modric, mind you, and, and then for a few of the others. But it'll be interesting to see. We always tend to underestimate Croatia just because of their 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 size and, and, and what have you. But they're in a tough group that Spain, Italy, who Fabrizio said has injury concerns. They could have players, but they don't have the same leaders as they used to in a Chiellini, Bonucci. There'll be calls and pressures on Chiesa to step up uh, as well. And then in that group, you also have Albania, who went undefeated in the group, led by Silvino, the old um, left back, who could also be, maybe we don't see them go through, but it was certainly will have a bearing on, on, on the rest of the teams, because I don't think it will be as easy as people think against Albania. I read an article just where I'm in, in a pre preparation mood and I read different articles and they say that the World Cup team that is confident going into the Euros, I mean, Albania is one of them, uh, very confident about their uh, kind of uh, chances. As you were saying, they, they, they don't like to lose. Not, they don't lose a lot either. So this is a very interesting group because you could still think that Albania will get some results. Uh, who will they, you, will, you will feel that Spain and, and Italy. But what about Croatia? I mean, this is a golden generation. This is, uh, uh, Marcus, you said that maybe, the, I think this may be the last Euros for Modric, but I, I think that we will see him at the next World Cup. Then he'll be 40. Uh, okay. We know that Cristiano Ronaldo is 39. Pepe is over 40 with Portugal. And uh, I think that Modric will be be there. Uh, after Tony Cross retired over Real Madrid, I think that made it easier for Real Madrid also to say that Modric can hang on to a year. So he'll be there. And and he's just a brilliant, brilliant player. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a very open group, Marcus. Yes, it will be. It will be interesting. We are obviously do not, doing none predictions so that people can come back and say, well, you guys, what do you what do you know about football and stuff like that? So we're very much, we can leave that to, to the other podcast, Group C, which we'll also leave to a lot of other podcasts, but because there's enough of people reviewing this endlessly because this is England's group. And we've got England, Denmark, Serbia, and Slovenia. Just a quick note on, on England, Gad. What I could say is you obviously got... Four of the eight Premier League uh, Player of the Year contenders. The PFA one hasn't come yet, up yet, which is the one players vote for. But of the Premier League, four of the eight were English. So you have enough profiles there to step up. You obviously have Bellingham in Spain. You have Harry Kane in, in Germany. Player to player, they should be favoured. But I must say, I'm not as optimistic as people might have it for England. Well, you live in England, and you know, uh, and you know, you know the deal. I know this deal since I was I was a kid, so which is with some years ago. England will always go into their own eyes as favourites, but we have to be fair to them. 
when when you see f- going forward, I mean, what do they have in Declan Rice? They have Saka. They have Foden. They have Bellingham. They had Cole Palmer. They have Harry Kane. I mean, this is enormous. I probably forgot someone as well. Uh, going backwards, they were struggling on the left back. We'll see if, if Shaw getting uh, fit. Uh, Maguire, who always produced for Gareth Southgate, is not around. I Kyle Walker, maybe the best right back in the world. He, he'll be there. Pickford, I, th- I think because of the body language of, of, of Pickford, although he has calmed down a bit, he's a bit underestimated because I think John Pickford is a great player and he's yeah. a great football keeper. I don't think that is a weakness in terms of England. I don't think they will be knocked out because of John, uh, because of Pickford. So it's a group they, they, they should go through. And we spoke to the one and only, again, uh, our friend and I, want, I admire most, most, so much respect for him is Henry Winter. So here we go again, the dear old English heading into another tournament, still believing, still convinced we can end the uh, the years of hurt. How many are we up to now? I think it's about 58 years of hurt anyway. Um, the years of hurt, are they going to end? <sighs> Uh, it depends. England needs Luke Shaw to regain his fitness and his match sharpness after four months out. England need John Stones to uh, recover from uh, the trapped ankle that he, he sustained in the game the other day. And he had not played uh, much. England need Mark Gay to uh, settle in as the left-sided centre-half with Harry Maguire's calf not um, able to have him, uh, to have him involved. Um, and... England also need Trent Alexander-Arnold to settle in quickly in central midfield in Southgate 4-2-3-1 formation um, alongside Declan Rice. But it's when you get to England's front six that there's far more cause for optimism. You look at Phil Foden, the uh, English Football of the Year, playing on the left and tucking inside. You look at Bukayo Saka on the right, if he's fit, and he's taken a few knocks this season on the right. You look at Jude Bellingham, the uh, the La Liga Player of the Year, outstanding for Real Madrid, playing in the centre. And then, of course, Harry Kane, who's a Bundesliga Player of the Year. So England have got all this attacking talent. Southgate has to find the right balance and hope that the defence is, uh, is in shape. And the other key thing with uh, with Southgate is that he has to make the right calls at the right moments in games, the crunch games, which he failed to against Croatia in 2018, which he failed to against Italy, particularly in the second half when Mancini regained the initiative at uh, the final of um, the last European Championship. So we're going to have a chance. They've got some fantastic players, but a semi-final would be impressive. That was uh, the famous journalist, Henry Winter, who has followed England for ages. And uh, Marcus Norway, I don't know if you saw the game because you were uh, busy uh, wedding, wedding uh, with, with, uh, in US, USA. And uh, Norway played Denmark, and Denmark looked quite good. They, they, looked, they looked solid. Kasper Juhlmann, their, their coach, he has a solid team, good organised, uh, good at the back. Kasper, Kasper Schmeichel did a save. Marcus, it was one of the best yeah, saves I've seen. I saw the highlights, yeah. Yeah, great, great save. And they were better than Norway. Uh, Højbjerg in midfield. A lot of, there's a lot of players there who has some, uh, something to prove. Uh, with, with Rasmus Højlund up front, you will always have the energy, keeping the ball, be, be on, on, on his move. So, so you should say England and, and Denmark, but wow, Marcus, before you will take maybe some facts on Slovenia, I'm always an admirer of Serbia because I've seen Serbia so many times been underestimated and one of my favourite, Mitrovic, uh, back from Arabia. He will be back in Europe and he'll probably score his goals. Yeah, but you always look at Serbia and they they do well enough to qualify and then you expect so much for them going into tournaments and then they tend to disappoint. Play In terms of the player material, you're completely right. In terms of what you expect from them, Mitrovic, we were a big, uh, both and a big admirer of, but tend to, to disappoint. Slovenia, they've got Cesco, obviously, um, but I think I'd hold England and Denmark to go through. Um, Denmark who have 11 or 12 players I think playing in England in in their squad just, just shows to the experience and the quality um, in their team they got the experience I was fortunate enough to go and interview uh, Christian Nurgor the Brentford captain um, who was uh, part of that and was able to reflect on his career but also the, the the Danish team he said maybe the expectations weren't that big from them but 
internally as a team, they have a lot of belief and as they should be having qualified to the semifinals in the last years where they lost out to England. And Ceszczesko uh, linked to a lot of English clubs uh, and today he, he will stay at Leipzig. I think that is good that he's staying. I think he needs another year to get mature, but he will probably extend his contract and then they will have some kind of they was talking about a gentleman's agreement, which means a clause somehow. He was linked to Arsenal, but I, I don't think he was ready to to lead the lines at, uh, at Arsenal. Great, great potential, but Sheshko will be interesting to follow at this World Cup. Sorry, Indeed. this Euros, Euros, Marcus, you have to find, watch out. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, only a couple of years away in the US, mind you. Um, group D is the another group of death that you had uh, that you had mentioned. It is France, it's Netherlands, it's Austria, and it is Poland. Wow, what a group. And for you know, for someone like yourself who knows how strong the Austria team as well, you understand the strength of this group, won't you, Dad? Yes, and 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 and, and Nether the Netherlands or Holland, they missed out on some on player uh, uh, De Jong out today, and now I'm going to start the the guy who played for Atalanta, Kop Kop uh, yeah. uh, who plays for Atalanta, winning the Europa League. He was out today. That that is. They will miss them. You have will have Van Dijk, of course. You will have a, a solid team, the Netherlands. But don't under, underestimate Austria. Yes, they have Alaba out. They have Schlager from Leipzig out. They have Schlager, another Schlager. Uh, uh, the goalkeeper is not there. So they've been lucky. I was with also the show yesterday with Schlager from Leipzig. He, he made his crucial ligament. He's uh, doing his reha now in Salzburg. Uh, and I say, how is it? Oh, it's so boring. But you just have to go through the motions. I felt sorry for him because he he was kind of the symbol of how Ragnik wanted to play his team. Remember, pressing, gegen pressing, intensity, umschalten, going into to from defense to attack. So so Austria will be interesting. Uh, David Alaba has been out for a long time. There there was a a little hope that he will uh, would be around, but they, they did the test now in May and there was no chance. And funny enough, uh, Ralf Ragnik has said that David Alaba is going to be a non-playing captain. So he's gone into more or less his staff. He's on the bench. Uh, I saw them in Switzerland. He was in there talking to the players, having conversations. Uh, a winner uh, of all kind of medals, uh, of course, for Bayern and Real Madrid, player of the year in Austria, 100 years in a row and so on. Uh, but it's going to be a lot up to Baumgartner, uh, players we know from, from the Bundesliga, Baumgartner, on fire, uh, hasn't played that much for Leipzig. Been great goal against Switzerland, and then you got Gregoric, uh, who's played for Freiburg. There's a lot of lot of players in there uh, with with uh, with something to prove as well. This team, and then you have Konrad Leimer, who is uh, that kind of player that you want in a in a Ralf Ragnick team. You have Sabitzer, uh, of course. I am a bit doubtful about uh, you. You know, the first goalkeeper I said Schlager is out. Who will be the goalkeeper? Uh, but but still, is he good? Is, are they good enough? The team, uh, and, and I'm not sure at the back if Austria is good enough. But what we do know, Marcus, that from attitude, nobody will beat this Austrian team. They are so together. There is a togetherness in the team, and and just just that feeling, Marcus, when your your coach can go to Bayern, one of the best teams in the world, one of the most prestigious jobs in the world, and you choose to stay. At Austria, because you you feel that you want to be a part of the development of a team. I mean that that is very good for for the team moral. Absolutely, um, and they will have a tough test. They will have obviously Poland with Lewandowski going off injured. There will be doubts as to as to his um, fitness. Uh, but then you have France and, and and Netherlands and France being the big favorites. Um, and when you look at their squad, I mean undoubtedly so. I mean the squad depth is incredible. Will they be your favourites, then? Well, it's easy money uh, to say France will be. But I also saw France losing uh, to Germany at home. Uh, but, but, but I mean, when you, when, you, when you see the squad, when you see the bench, I mean, they, they must have the best bench of them all. Uh, and Mbappé will, will probably go ballistic again. A fantastic football player. I think a lot of the weight of his shoulders as well now that is, is official as he's going to play for. Real Madrid. Uh, so, what, what can you say about France? They need, they have to be favourites. Uh, but like I said, uh, that Germany game, 
losing at home. Maybe that was good for them. What do I know? But but still, they 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 are the they are the safe money. Let's put it that way. And without more for us to say, we left it to Jules Lorenz to uh, provide a little insight on the French team. Hi guys, it's Jules. Thank you so much for having me on your show. In terms of France and the Euros, obviously a lot of optimism and confidence going into the competition because I think France have one of the best squads in the world. They have the best player in the world in Kylian Mbappe. They've got one of the best defenders in the world in William Saliba. And he's not guaranteed to start at all. Maybe one of the best national team head coaches, not just in the world currently, but maybe in the history of the game in Deschamps as well, which obviously has reached, has reached two World Cup finals, one won, one lost, and one Euro final as well in his current tenure as the France head coach. Because it's a reminder that France have reached the final of three of the last big four tournaments, really four big tournaments in the Euro 2016 and the last two World Cups. So it feels like this team is ready, that Deschamps is ready. There's so much talent really in the squad. There's the right mix of youth and experience. There's this ruthlessness that I think you need to go find tournaments like that, where you create your own luck, where you force it almost. You might not always be the best team on the pitch, like we saw in Qatar in the World Cup quarterfinals against England, for example, especially in the second half, even at some point against Morocco. But yet you still win because you've got that kind of winning mentality and the French have a lot of that, really. So it looks certainly on paper that things are great and that this tournament should be a successful one. Really, a successful Euros is to win it. The, the uh, official line is to reach at least the semi-final, but I think with everything that I've just mentioned, they need to go all the way. Um, maybe the, the biggest weakness, in a way, in this squad is ourselves and how sometimes we take things for granted, that we have that arrogance in us. Remember the last Euros in the last 16 against Switzerland, where France are 3-1 up with 10 minutes to go and we all think it's over, that's it. We're already in the quarterfinals, we're already thinking who we're going to play in the quarterfinals and we take our eye off the ball. The Swiss score two goals to make it 3-3. Extra time is a bit too late, then it's penalties and then they knock us out. So I'm sure the boys would have learned from what happened there and not make the same mistake. But really this is, I think, the, um, the potential weakness in that team. Apart from that, it's a stacked squad with so much talent and again, so much experience that really the French should be going far in this tournament. And interesting, Marcus, with Jules. I mean, one of the, the guys with most knowledge uh, is a colleague of mine at ESPN. And it's funny because we are all on sitting here, I do, or hotels and I'm doing my stuff. But then we meet each other. So I met him. I met Jules at Wembley and he was sitting just in front of the platform at Servus Tefau had uh, the, the TV show. So I went over to Jules and had a good chat with him, I think. And then I went back up on the platform. And next day, it was with uh, with Gab and Jules, the podcast. And he said, I spoke to Jan, but he spoke German with me all the time. So my my mindset was German. So I went down to him. Does he speak German? Just, no, he doesn't speak German at all. So he said on the, on the podcast, oh my God. Mar, Mar, Jan came down and he spoke to me in German all the time. So... Next day in the ESPN show, there was one of the questions, why did the hand speak with Jules? And I, and I started laughing because it, it's straight, when I was told, I remember I spoke German with him because, I mean, I have my native language is Norway, of course, uh, and English, English and German. So I was in the German mood because I did a German show. Uh, so I spoke German to him. But, but France... France will be there, Marcus. The Netherlands, we, we're not sure. We're not sure. What Under Coleman, you never know, do you? We will never know what, what, what they will do. And then we got Poland, as you were saying, Lewandowski. Out. And Lewandowski has, hasn't done... I mean, he's one of the best number nines of his generations, but we never succeeded so big in the tournaments. So, of course, it's, it's bad also for them that uh, if Lewandowski is out. This is a very open group. You, you feel... You feel that France will run away with it, but still, this is gonna. There's gonna be some funny result. This could be the real group of death, where there could be a lot of, lot of teams on the same on the same points. Yeah, undoubtedly, it will go to 
plan as to all our predictions and, and what have you. The quality is so strong and you see a player to player. And going into Group B, which will be perceived as one of the easier groups, so to speak, at least as far as Belgium is concerned, it's Belgium, Romania, Ukraine and Slovakia. But even still, obviously you had Belgium. And I wonder, Dominique Tedesco, Dad, the, the former Leipzig and, and, and Schalke coach, um, has rather successfully managed that mix of the older guard and then you have a, a younger sort of generation going through undefeated in, in qualifying. You maybe think that this is the maybe the last chance of that go initial golden generation to, to have a go um, at it. And then you have Romania, Ukraine and Slovakia. And for me, I think, you know, I wouldn't, I would fancy Ukraine to go, th go through there. You have some players there you have Dovbik obviously became the La Liga top scorer just in front of our uh, Norwegian uh, in Alexander Serlot there with the, the Girona being the the team of the season arguably in terms of what was expected um I went to Bournemouth and uh, had an interview produced an interview with their def young defender who had played every single minute of, of Bournemouth's Premier League games this season. You have Yarmolenko, who was at West Ham. These sort of players that come to life, and that's what I love about the Euros, is when you have these type of players that might be a bit, not underestimated, but um, a bit overlooked in, in the mix of all other uh, profiles. And that's what I look forward to. And I actually think that Dovbik would be one of those players for, for, for Ukraine and in the Euros. But... Romanian and Slovakia, uh, Slovakia, admittedly, Dad, we, I don't know too much about them, but we know that Romania had a, a very strong qualifying as well. Yeah, and it, this is one of the, those groups that you said is easy, but still it's going to be very tight because you, you will feel that the teams are quite on a similar... Belgium with the talents, with the Bruyne, with Lukaku and so on. Tedesco, I will tell you a bit about Tedesco. Tedesco was one of the youngest coaches in, in the Bundesliga and he took... Um, he took Schalke to a silver medal and he went into Champions League. I interviewed him a couple of times in, in the Champions League and he got fired at Schalke. Been a bit round. He was criticized for being an iPad coach. You know, you know, people having a, uh, giving him a bit, uh, bullying him a bit because he didn't have the experience. But to be fair to him, Marcus, he's tried, as you were saying, tried to find a mix. You need some balls to say to Courtois that you're not being a part of our, for my squad. I mean, Angelotti took him back to winning the Champions League and, and he's not in the squad. That, that just tells you a bit where Tedesco is. Uh, yes, there's a lot of gold generations hanging around at this Euros and, and Belgium is one of them. So Belgium is a team that, you know they have the cap cap capacity capacity uh, to, to 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 go far. I'm not I'm not saying they go all the way, but it's going to be interesting because Tedesco he likes to organize his teams. He when he was a Schalke, he was near he was criticized for over uh, over coaching the teams some sometimes. But find find that there is some interesting when you see you have Yakin uh, the the coach at Switzerland. Not the same type, but have been around for a while, more practical going into that game. Tedesco will be a, a coach that will plan everything. He will do the analysis uh, 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 on the way they're going to play. So they should go easy through in this group and then we'll see how far they could could go. But it's interesting now, Marcus, in general, there's a lot of players we, we're talking about, a Shesko or a, a Sabersly or what they all call. There's no place to hide when you win your national team because if you're in a, in a great team, if you're playing for, for Barcelona or Real Madrid or whatever, then you go back and you play with your team. So that is that is why we often see teams doing so well because they're underestimated in our eyes because they play in teams with a lot of stars maybe. But so this is the second best of, of players that can go out there and show themselves that well, wow, look at me. I'm, now I'm the leader of my national team. Uh, but when I'm in my normal daily football life, I only uh, are allowed to give the water to the superstars. Yeah, no, but it's true. And it's, when they, it's something to be said about that. When they come back and step up, there is no place to hide. Um, and in Group F, a player who certainly has taken responsibility when he's come to his national team, 128 goals in 206 games. He is the all-time Euros top scorer. He has the most games. He scored in five straight European Championship. Um, 
He has the joint most assists since it was recorded in 1972. But even still, there were recalls for him not starting for Portugal. They say that he's they're better without him in the team. There's only one man I'm speaking of when I mentioned Cristiano Ronaldo and one of the the big favorites for this tournament in in Portugal. Is Port are Portugal better without Cristiano Ronaldo then? Well, he's getting older, uh, and uh, for me, uh, if I'm going to pick one, when I will say this is the team that I see as my favourite, uh, I, I will pick Portugal. Portugal got in all positions so many good players, and Cristiano Ronaldo, wow, what can you say? He's his sixth championship, European championship. Yeah, he's... I and mean, then, yeah, you can say playing in Saudi Arabia, the, 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 it's not like that this is the best leagues. It's not even the second best leagues uh, in that. There is a bad league when you compare with the other leagues in the world. But still, Marcus, when we see his, the highlights, what we see when he scores goals, you see the passion he's got. When he scores a goal, he loves scoring goals. And I think that uh, uh, the the Portuguese, uh, Martinez, uh, the, Roberto the Martinez. Co- Martinez, we know him. And he, is, he has found a way how to use him. I think that he will sit down with him. I think Cristiano Ronaldo knows all about the records. He knows that, can I score in another city? He, he Just come on, do a penalty or whatever. I don't think he will start. It's, it's Ramos, I guess, will, will be, be number one. We remember him from uh, from some great games uh, over the years. Uh, so I think that he will, he will start. But Cristiano Ronaldo, I think we should see ourselves as lucky that we can have a look at one of one of the greatest players of all time, Cristiano Ronaldo. He's still around. He still has his hunger. Is he as good as he used to be? No. Is he good enough to be in the squad of Portugal? Yes. So they found a way to use him. Uh, a funny thing, Marcus, uh, maybe mentioned that in another episode when we talked about something else. But uh, uh, when I was standing in the tunnel uh, at Wembley doing the FA Cup and I did interviews and I did the official interview, uh, I spoke to Bruno Fernandes. I think he's one of the players that could could be one of the stars at this Euros because he's always involved in assists or goals. He's, he's very influential for Portugal, of course. So I asked him, uh, what's the minimum uh, target for Portugal at the Euros? And he said, to win it. That is a whole minimum target. So they see themselves as one of the favourites. And I will have them up there. So absolutely, because you know they can score goals. You know that they're good organised. Martinez is a sensible coach. I say sensible in terms of his pragmatic. He's shown that in his leadership, how he's handled Cristiano Ronaldo, Ronaldo because there's a lot of coaches who wouldn't manage to do that. Uh, because whatever, if you take Cristiano Ronaldo to a, to a championship, you have to handle him. But it's also seem, and I have to give that a bit also to Cristiano Ronaldo, he knows what he's on to now. He knows that he, he got his goals in this qualification as well. And there's no surprise if he comes up with the two, three goals at these uh, Euros as, as well. I have this theory. I think he's on 830, 840 goals. I don't think he will retire until he has a thousand career goals because that's how obsessed he is with with scoring. But we'll see it. That will require a few I'm a mention, years. Marcus. I'm a mention, Marcus. When I was, and I've said this before, when I went to Real Madrid when he was playing midfield, he, he came a bit from, from the left. This was in the start of his Real Madrid career. He had, had been there for a long time and uh, for a long time. And they said, well, he'd play a midfield now and then he'll go up front because this man will score goals all his life. And they said that Pelé scored over a thousand goals. Some different counting, maybe. Pelé was one, maybe the greatest footballer of all time, if you have a look at 58, 62, and 70, when he was fantastic. Because Cristiano Ronaldo has the passion for it, and I, I respect him for that. Let him play as long as he wants. You see Messi as well. I don't think Messi has uh, said that he won't be at the next World Cup either. We'll be surprised that a 40-year-old uh, Cristiano Ronaldo will run around in Canada, USA and Mexico? No, we won't. Absolutely not. The 2016 champions, that is, had a 100% uh, winning record in the qualifiers. And as you mentioned, I mean, the players, Rafael Leao, Bernardo Silva, Diego Iota, Gonzalo Romas, wow. Ramos, João Felix, Neto. I mean, the list goes on. Very strong group or very strong yeah, group of players. And they're up against Turkey, Czech Republic and Georgia. Georgia are the debutants. They were Norway's group. I didn't find them particularly strong in that group. They have Quarciaela from Napoli. Never know how to pronounce it, but will obviously be a strong player. Led by the old former Bayern Munich right back, Willy Sagnol. 
uh, that we saw them in the group. I wasn't particularly convinced, but fantastic. The only debutants in the tournament. Um, and then we got Turkey and Czech Republic. Now, I looked into this. That's, this is Czech Republic's eighth consecutive European championship. The last time they didn't qualify was 1992 with Czechoslovakia. And the last Euros joint top scorer was Patrick Schick. Might we see something from Czech Republic, perhaps? Schick Republic, I thought you said. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it could it could be a tabloid thing. I think what, what we need to, to say, Mark, is Czech Republic, Croatia, Slovenia, Serbia, a fantastic football culture. You just we see how hard it is for Norway now. It's twenty four years since we were at the at the championship, and they always tend to produce talents. Uh, in this group, I will also mention Turkey. Uh, I was many many years ago in Germany, and I had the honor to uh, to make uh, uh, or give the prize to the to the young player of the season in German football, Shalanoglu. Uh, and uh, now he's a vital player at uh, at uh, in Turkey. Uh, I got a feeling that Turkey got something going on here. Uh, that in this group they they obviously have a great chance to go to the next round. It's going to be interesting to see how far they will come. It's interesting also about Turkish football at the moment because there is a, a there is an optimism now. Of course, with Mourinho coming to Fenerbahce, you just just feel that something will happen to Turkish football. Uh, and great for them. Great for a. Uh, a football mad uh, country. I, I, I played there. I nearly signed for Bursa Sport uh, back in the days. I all nearly signed for Trabzon Sport, but uh, I, I felt I couldn't go there. Uh, your mom was pregnant with uh, the host, so I felt that was a big way to go. So I went to the to Swindon Town instead. But it's it's a mad football country, and I think that would that what these these teams have uh, in common, Marcus. We know that this will be, as we know, going to land this episode. This is going to be a fantastic championship because there's so many nations in Europe. I mean, nearly all of them. I mean, that love their football. I mean, this this is the big thing. You say the Scots will come with two hundred thousand. England will be there. The Danes will be there. The the East Europeans will come. I mean. And then, then, then it's just like it's amazing and everybody can come to Germany because Germany is in the middle of Europe. You can put yourself in a car to get there. You, then they will be amazing. I think the fan zones in Germany will be amazing. I mean, th there's so many people who come without tickets. They will be in the fan zones. Uh, let's pray and hope that there will be no problem that this, uh, at these Euros, that the, the, the security will be good, that people will behave uh, and then we're up for one of the greatest, greatest tournament of all time. Yeah, but in Germany, especially, we all remember 2006 World Cup. That's one of the uh, earliest memories. I remember 2002, 2004, I remember, but 2006 just had this special feeling. I think even now it captures our nostalgia for football because it was so special. We're fortunate enough, having covered the Bundes, Bundesliga, especially the last two years, we know how it will be. We know it will be well organized. We know the fans will be good. I'm so looking forward to it. I know you're working throughout it, but I can't wait to go watch it and have it on all day. Um, and like you said, having these different contingents in these countries, you'll have a good solid Turkish contingent. You have a Ukrainian contingent, et cetera, et cetera. It will be a, a very special tournament. And we will be catching up throughout the tournament. We'll find time um, between your busy schedule, of course, and we'll try and review games, happenings, what have you. But this will be the first, Mark, the first episode of, of the Football Channel, our Euros uh, preview. So before you set off into the wind to Austria with your um, with your scheduling and, and the Euros, any any departing words, so to speak? No, I just want to say that uh, this was our first episode. We call it now the Fußball Channel, uh, and we will use this channel, we'll use this platform to to talk to people. Thank you very much for all your uh, input. You can do that over Twitter, but you can also do it on our YouTube channel. And please uh, follow us, because that is very inspiring for us when we see that the community is growing. So the Fußball Channel is here to stay, and uh, I love to do this Together with you, Marcus, I was also inspired yesterday when I was with with brother of Tony Cross, Felix Cross, who had a great football career himself, by the way. But of course, a bit in the shadow of a Tony Cross. I mean, the most players in the world are in the shadow for one of the greatest in German football. But they have a, a a podcast together as well. So we look forward to speak to people, or we speak to you guys 
uh, over these uh, euros and and I will try to be very disciplined and you know Marcus that I like to be at one place at a time but I never end up doing that so but I will know because I have to 22 days I do all the games and we so look forward to it uh, Norway's not there uh, but thank God I have a bit the German blood in me I've got a bit Austrian blood in me I've got a bit Aus uh, Austrian German and English blood in me uh, because I play there so I, I got a feeling for, for this team I love the Scots uh, I mean there's so many teams uh, that I have a sympathy for so to be a neutral going into these Euros just to enjoy the football is a fantastic feeling and with that we will catch up and as always Auf Wiedersehen Auf Wiedersehen